You are listening to Logistics Rocks, the podcast about the rock stars of the logistics industry. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Robert Falk. I am the founder, inventor, and CEO of Enride. Enride, that's a company who has been uh, written about a lot for the last 12 months, something like that. Quite a lot, yes. Yeah. Uh, what's Enride? Enride is the first provider that's uh, working with providing ADET systems to, uh, for transport for a global market, utilizing new technology as self-driving technology, as well as electrical vehicles to provide a completely new way of doing transport. Self-driving electrical vehicles for freight, not for passenger transport. No, exactly, for freight transport. You're based in Sweden? We are based in Sweden, but we also have a big presence in the US and we are going to move into the US during the end of this year. Just to recap, you want to put a few hundred of these uh, vehicles, the T-Pods as they are called, uh, on the road network in Sweden by 2020. Yes, and uh, as we started out, that's uh, it's just actually almost year, one and a half year old, that perception now. And as it looks now, we're going to be able to beat that and probably get even more than we expected on that one. So we have the customers, we have the momentum and we are following the plan that we did two years ago quite well. So uh, to explain to the listeners, what is it you do? What's the, well, what's the, you, you have this vehicle. Are you a vehicle manufacturer? No, we are more, we are the system provider. So what we do is to provide an extra platform for transport. And that, of course, has a component of hardware in it. And I think that uh, you have to rethink a little bit how the context and what actually is a great benefit, but we are providing the platform for transport and the most best equivalent is that we've done an AGV system that you're being used inside factories. We've taken the exact same concept and applied it to the roads. So it's an AGV, automated guided vehicle, made for public roads. Exactly. And is it fully autonomous? What, what level of autonomous driving are we talking about? We are working on level four. And we are applying it uh, in in contextual environments and we're working and solving the actual transport. So we are not an autonomous developing company. We are a transport developing company, finding and applying it that where we can use transport. And to be able to do that, we are utilizing autonomous as well as remote drive. That's level four. So it can do most of it by itself, but a human being can assist uh, via remote control. And uh, yeah, if we look at the the, the um, economics of a haulage company, uh, there must be huge benefits of removing the driver and maybe keep one third or one fourth or one tenth driver per vehicle or something like that. Yeah, of course. This is uh, for me. It's uh, if, of course it's a very good business case behind it. But for me, it's the most staggering or most exciting business cases for the fact that. The business case actually for applying electrical and battery in this way is actually better than utilizing a diesel platform. So what we have here is a really good business case in creating a sustainable transport system that's actually driven not by environmental concerns, even if extremely important, it's driven by a business case. So it's electric and it's autonomous and they will never be diesel powered? I think there are applications where diesel has its advantages. Uh, but like I said, I think that the, the business case and the driving force behind it will make them electric. So And, and uh, in Sweden, the electricity is quite clean as well. We have a uh, mar- very small margin of coal. Coal power, the rest is hydro and, and nuclear and wind uh, in Sweden. So, of course, it will be a sustainability leap forward to convert a fleet to, to these types of vehicles. But uh, if we look at it from the logistics point of view, okay, these vehicles exist. Um, what type of uh, networks are you planning on putting them putting these vehicles in? Is it city distribution or is it uh, long haulage? Or what? And the main application where the best business case is is that mid and long haul. 
it's a uh, city di- distribution is uh, still as i say a service where the driver is a big part of that service and i think that uh, the also the business case and the distance motivates that uh, the best application for our systems are to be the backbone of transport systems so in essence it's it's an autonomous system for for intra hub yes transportation exactly so and I think that will be interesting in a lot of different markets. Not just Sweden. Sweden is a large country. We have a large geography. So so, but you have you have, for instance, US, yeah. uh, Australia, also a company that where, where you have large capacity vehicles because it's such a big part of the society to move stuff very long distances. For sure, yeah. and I mean, I think the apple. I mean, for me, there are uh, a little bit of distinction between long haul and extreme long haul. If you have extreme long haul, it's very seldom makes sense to have this kind of system thinking unless you have extreme volumes. Yeah, but, and electric, you have limited range yeah, as well. Exactly. And I think that the best applications for us is somewhere between 200 up to 500 kilometers in range. That's the optimal length. So, so what, what, what's the range of the, the T-Pods that you currently have now? Uh, we really very seldomly think about range in that aspect. What we do is to optimize and see and how we run them. So we run them in cycles depending on the different applications. Okay. So, but in essence, it's it's uh, it's much much simpler than a combustion engine, of course. So you have uh, a lot of batteries that make up for the weight, and then you have a loading compartment, and then you have electric uh, motors. Uh, exactly on the wheels yeah. and a ton of sensors of course yeah and antennas and things like that. yeah and never to underestimate that that the biggest part of it is to be able to provide a system because overall is the brains of the solution is not in the vehicles it's uh, in the complete system as a log- logistician, I think that's uh, really important. It's not the single transport leg that's important. It's, no. it's, it's what the system can provide, of course. And I think uh, speaking of logistics, it's, I think that for me, it's also a big uh, optimized and developed from this perspective that uh, if you have new way of transporting, it doesn't make sense to optimize the size I think we all agree that the, the filling rate of the existing transport system is quite low. And a big part of that is has to do with the size of the actual transport vehicles. Mm. Yeah, that's one way of filling the vehicles is, is actually to reduce the size of them, yes. of course. But then you have to increase the number of them or inc- increase the frequency. Yeah, and that only makes sense if you have autonomous vehicles. And I think that the big reason behind trucks being so huge is the fact that uh, they try to reap some um, extra tonnage for each driver. Of course. But if you see the complete system, you see that it actually, for the complete vehicles, it doesn't make all sense to make them bigger. So so if, if we look at it from a systems perspective, let's say you have, uh, you have a network of uh, a number of DCs or terminals or, or hubs, and the com- uh, when you compare your solution on a system level to the traditional truck driver based solution in what range would you say that the savings will be uh, the savings between compared yeah, compared between the traditional of long haul trucks and the end ride uh, autonomous system We're, when it's fully developed and yeah i would say that we are looking at a disruptive change yeah, it's uh, fully uh, developed and fully applied. It's going to be the backbone of transport. That's quite a bold statement, but but yeah, I I've seen the teapot. We will in the show notes. We will we will uh, link to some material, of course, some videos and things like that. And uh, yeah, it's it's a really interesting concept when you combine autonomous and electric, and a new type of vehicle. Really, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's sometimes it's just very good to come from a white to a white page and be able to don't have to consider the legacy and doesn't have to consider what has been done before and it will take some time and i'm very humble when it comes to the fact that i'm not sure that android will be one to succeed but i'm very very confident about the logic behind it and the actual engineering behind it the technology exists and the market 
is there and the logic and business case is there so it's going to be uh, more about industrial change and industrial change take time but once it's there it's going to be extremely efficient mm-hmm. yeah well, some industries change faster than others yes. look, look look at the hotel industry or the tech sure. industry i mean we are in the age of disruption yes and you are previously your previous career was in the automotive industry yes so correct. you have sort of changed teams now uh, or something like that. Yeah, well, I consider myself to be uh, in uh, the field of engineering and technology development. So it's, uh, and I think that's, um, for me personally, I think that, uh, I think it's um, about providing and creating a better future and using the technology that we have to be able to address and really trying to make a change that we require and the big driver for me behind what i do is of course to push the market in the right direction and yeah i think you mentioned the fact that that we it's a lot to do with electric where it comes from how it's electricity is produced that's also a system yeah but i think uh, something is very seldom discussed is the fact that once you go electric you can also much easier work with how you supply it. Mm-hmm. And if you look at just at the macro of the other major economical changes that we're seeing, is of course that renewable power is becoming increasingly, increasingly uh, uh, cheap. And if you look at the countries that had the most uh, um, coal and the most oil to produce electricity or also the countries with the most um that the code had the best um possibilities to go for renewable energy like solar cells mm-hmm. so i think uh providing electricity and providing electric transport and cars uh, to the market is going to allow for that change to happen mm-hmm. But it's going to be very hard to do if we still are on diesel and gas cars. Yeah, we have multiple development vectors converging yeah, exactly. uh, here. Yeah, uh, I see that in other areas as well. And, and, and it's, it's really exciting to see the pace of development that's constantly increasing now. So things are moving uh, very, very fast. One question I always ask is, is uh, since this podcast is called Logistics Rocks, oh, yeah. you have to pick a rock song. Oh, that's simple. That's uh, I mean, once we launch or do something with Android, we have a theme song, and it's uh, Thunderstruck by ACDC. Yes, finally we have Thunderstruck on the playlist. Thank yeah. you, thank you. And actually, I knew uh, I suspected this because I, I watched your live. The latest launch you had yeah. was a completely, or not completely different, but very different system that you are now targeting, and that's forest transport. Yeah, and uh, I think that's something that's here in Scandinavia and Sweden in particular, the forestry transport is a huge market. Yeah. And it's very underrated when it comes to how repetitive it is and how good business you can do in installing autonomous transport there as well. You're talking about logs now? Yeah. Uh, but are these are these vehicles going to go out into the forest that's part of the plan yes autonomously yeah wow (laughs) Uh, Uh, but uh, you have to consider the fact that these are i think the average transport uh, distance for Mm -hmm. logs are uh, 80 kilometers yeah and and a lot of transport is done between the um, hubs for uh, collecting points yeah and uh, a lot of when it comes, for instance, when you go for in small, f- small forests and so you can have remote drive, yeah, and you combine it with it. And there are a lot of trials being done with simpler and those kind of applications. And uh, I had a meeting with one of their, um, um, with a big client that are super excited with this. And uh, I think that the ones inside it really see the potential Mm -hmm. and i think we launched and i think a lot of people seen that i think we have over thousand articles globally of the launch of the you launched at the goodwood festival of speed which is sort of the 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 combustion engine main event of the year almost Uh, and you launched an electric truck for wood transport yeah how was the reception amazing 
Yeah. It's uh we had a splendid uh, treat and we were invited by the Duke of Richmond to be presenting and launching at his event and he is a huge fan of uh, automotive and engineering and technology. Mm-hmm. And I think uh it's uh I wouldn't say the combustion engine, but it's a celebration of speed. Yeah. And fancy cars. And fancy cars. Yeah. And I think there are Tesla was there, <coughs> Polestar was there. Yeah. And I think there are a lot of, uh, there was super excited with overall to have uh, a good, uh, to see the future. And uh, um, I would say that we definitely picked the right place to launch. I think that, uh, like I said, in the event that, Let's keep the combustion engine for the fun of it mm-hmm. and make the switch where we can make the switch. We still ride horses. Yes. For fun. Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't think that uh, we are actually more horses now than we were 100 years ago. But uh, that's not very, that's very often seldom we discussed. But uh, I think that the combustion engines and sport cars are going to be around for a long time. But I think that the business case with electric and autonomous will make a transition in the transport industry. Yeah. So uh, and now, <clears throat> while we are looking ahead, um, I also ask my my um, the people I talk to about if you have 10 million euros or dollars, it's virtually the same thing now. Yeah. Um, what would you invest in? Oh, and it, it, no bitcoins or things like that. It has to be logistics related. Okay, of course, I have to say Enride. Yeah. And I think that we are really picking up this momentum. We just closed around and, uh, and we are super psyched to moving forward. Um, and if you're not allowed to invest in Enride because you've already done it, what would be your te- area of technology or, or industry? I would say that uh, logistics or all is uh, facing a disruptive change. Yeah. And uh, I think that... that Autonomous and self-driving cars will take a lot longer time, but for transport, it's happening within within the next ten years. Yeah, and uh, and that ties into my my uh, uh, next question, and that is, what what do you think would be a typical occupation in the transport industry in ten years? Uh, I think that uh, in the transport industry, it's going to be a lot about uh, uh, operations. And uh, operating systems, and operating uh, to be on the planning side and, and uh, making the decisions. Not necessary. I think that's going to be a little bit 2010. I think that a lot of planning and systemization. I think that maintenance and operations of systems are going to be something that's going to expand. That's what you see inside factories that you don't spend that much time in planning existing routes or what's you do one process and then you sort of say it's fixed. Are, are, are you seeing a future where the number of jobs will decrease? They will do other things, but m- less people will be required I, I in the would, transport industry. I would say that we will see, if you look at it, I would say that uh, it will definitely rearrange what how we work and what we do and i think that i think we will lots of new jobs created but they will not be necessarily in operating the transport itself yeah of course since they become more or less i mean if you reach level four yeah one driver can actually theoretically operate multiple vehicles yeah uh, so that's a given. But uh, I, I mean, logistics is growing between is it three or four percent per year? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, e-commerce is growing by twenty. Yeah, and I think it's that that's really highlights it. That I think that I think that the rationalization of people working in it will not uh, keep up with the expansion of the market. So what's your what's your best advice to someone starting out in the field now? It can either be the field of, of uh, startups, tech companies doing trying to disrupt the system or starting out in general in the transportation industry. To become really good at something. The good advice, yeah. It's, uh, I think that when, when I was in uh, university, everyone said that you need to get a real job and you need to work with 
for five, ten years, maybe fifteen years somewhere that you really know something. That's just a lot of bullshit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that we are in a new type of economy and knowledge society where we actually can quite easily get access to data, access to knowledge. So you need to be able to process that and understand it. And that's the key to be successful in that digital environment. And I think that the best advice is to be able to understand what you do and become really good at what you want to do. You see an increased need for data scientists, uh, analytical skills. I would say that what I the most driver behind it is that I see more and more um, that you need to take more and more responsibility and really understanding the topics that you're working with, no matter what it is, because why we still see some distinction between what can be auto- autonomous and be optimized in the future. And where humans has an understanding is that really when you understand the input of the data and AI is coming in many areas, but at least in our lifetime, there will be st- still a need for humans to tell the call, the, the computer and everything involved in that what to do. Yeah, it's bad to drive into trees, for yes. instance, things like that. Don't and, uh, don't run over people no. in the street. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But basically, I mean, uh, we can teach a computer to play chess uh, because the rules are so so simple to to uh, define. But the rules of driving a car, yeah, uh, and uh, it's m- much much more difficult. Yeah, and I think that it's uh, going to be our responsibility for a long time moving forward to create games like chess that we can use computers to play. And and when it comes to uh, uh, the responsibility part, yep. because that's one one of the big hurdles, uh, the, the legal aspect of autonomous driving. Yep. Where are we now and where are we going there? First of all, I think that uh, when you ask the question, it's like legislation is always in place for society to protect its uh, the people in it yep. and be the, to the greater... Uh, good of society and i think that we need and will see and something we working with very much in the next couple of years is going to be to institutionalize the zero death and traffic because the autonomous vehicles and autonomous technology has the potential to reduce uh, um, accidents in traffic and actually create a system where we see zero death and traffic mm-hmm. And I think that that's something we need to do common, all and everyone involved. And I think, and I see that we're very, not that far off that we're going to be able to create and we'll have a platform like in the aviation business where we see that we will have um, some kind of collaboration between everyone involved working on sharing data, how to avoid crashes. Mm -hmm and how to avoid fatalities and injuries in traffic. And I think it's extremely important to understand that and that the technology we have will have to serve the greater good of society. And that's, uh, I think, is important to highlight when you say that legislation is a hurdle because it's more, like I would say, an uh, opportunity in about creating what kind of future would we like to see. Mm-hmm. So you can be proactive and saying, okay, we want to move faster than the rest of the world towards autonomous vehicles on the on the highways, for instance, and then we can proactively opening up one lane for them or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of options moving forward. And I think that everyone, when I was starting to sort of say work with this two or three years ago, mm-hmm. you know, I was saying that that technology was still a few years off and the maturity of society was a few years off. But for me now, I what I see is that people are more expecting it to happen. Yeah. So it's uh, I would say that it's not five years off. I would say in the next couple of years, we will start to see a lot of these applications. I know when the first cameras came to mobile phones, I was like, what will I possibly have a camera on my mobile phone for? I will never use it. And look at me now. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yeah. And thank you, Robert. 
Thank uh, you. For, Always a pleasure. Uh, for giving me um, even more information about Enride. And I will post some links, of course, and also your contact details. So, uh, see you. Thank you. Very nice to meet you. And thank you for hosting me. Thank you, Robert. We will definitely continue to follow Enride and your journey. And I know that since we recorded this interview, Enride has made advances when it comes to the remote control of the vehicles and they recently demoed a remote control from Spain to Sweden over 5G. And also recently they got the first permit to actually try the teapot on public roads in Sweden. This is it for volume 2 of Logistics Rocks. I hope you have enjoyed the listening as much as I did recording it. All the songs are on the playlist on Spotify and on logistics.rocks you can find my contact info. That's logistics.rocks. In the next volume, we will focus on blockchain. So make sure you've clicked subscribe in your podcast app. And as always, if you like what you hear, please give me a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher or Podchaser. My name is Perlo Farnes and thank you again for listening to Logistics Rocks.